I just want to welcome everyone. This is our fourth Snats Chats. Uh, Nats has had great success with their Nats Chats for years, and we're really excited to continue to present this forum aimed specifically at Snats members. Uh, if you've missed some of our previous Snats Chats, uh, you can find them on the Snats section. They're archived there, the Snats section of the Nats website, snats.org. Uh, I want to open up um, the chat. I'm going to type in my email address. It's eric.hood at usu.edu. It's in the chat section now. So if you have ideas about future presentations you'd be interested in hearing, future topics, or maybe a topic you'd be interested in presenting for the Snats chat, please email me those suggestions and we'll uh, we'll explore them for the future. We do these uh, twice a year, once fall semester and once spring semester. So please email me with ideas. Uh, Okay, so the way this evening is going to work is I'm going to introduce our guest in just a moment, uh, and then she'll give her presentation. Afterwards, we'll have some time for questions from Melissa, and uh, there are two ways that you can ask these questions. You can ask them by uh, clicking the raise hand button on your um, uh, on your dashboard, your webinar dashboard. And in that case, I can put your audio on, and you can ask Melissa your question yourself. Or if that seems a little scary to you, you can just uh, submit your question in writing, and I will uh, I'll get that to Melissa, uh, and I'll read that for you. So two ways to submit your questions. Um, I suggest, though, holding your questions to the end, because I guarantee Melissa's presentation will probably answer a couple of the questions you may have while she does that. So listen to the whole presentation. Uh, I've already glanced at her slides. It's some really great information there. So, uh, and hold those questions to the end and then we'll get to them. Uh, so uh, with that, let's go ahead and introduce our guest, Melissa. Thank you so much for being with us. Melissa, I'm gonna read a little bit of your bio for everyone so that people who don't know who you are uh, can get to know you a little bit. So Melissa is an avid performer and voice teacher uh, in the Los Angeles, California area. Current member of the LA Opera Chorus and a soloist with the LA Opera Outreach Program. Uh, Melissa recently made her solo main stage debut in the opera's production of Carmen. Uh, in the 2016-2017 season, Melissa appeared in Tosca and Abduction from the Seraglio at the LA Opera. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Music from Northwestern University, which uh, is also my alma mater, Masters, uh, oh. class of 2010, so go Wildcats, uh, and uh, Master of Music from DePaul University. Currently pursuing her Doctor of Music Arts at University of Southern California where she serves as a teaching assistant and as president of her SNATS chapter there at USC. So uh, Melissa also currently uh, on the Faculty of Idlewild's Arts Summer Program and a member of the National Association of Teachers of Singing. So with that, Melissa, I would love if you can take it away. I made you the presenter, so you should be able to share your screen for your slides. Okay. I'll turn off my camera because no one needs to see my face while you're presenting, and then I'll hop back on uh, when it's time for questions. So right. take it away, Melissa. Okay, so can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, okay, so thank you so much for that intro, Eric. I'm so happy to get to talk about this topic. And I really envisioned this Snats chat to be geared towards students or recent graduates who are just trying to figure out where to start in building their own private voice studio. So all of what I'm going to talk about is based on my own experience. So just know that as we move forward. When I moved to Los Angeles in 2010, I knew very few people. You know, I hadn't gone to school in this area, and that can be a really great thing for connections in making in starting your own small business. But I didn't have any of those. So I really had the experience of building my studio from the ground up. So I'm gonna share with you some of the things I learned along the way, and I hope give you some really concrete steps to take in order to get your own studio started. So, okay, so first we're gonna talk about finding new students because let's face it, if you don't have any students in your studio, all of the other pieces of the puzzle that we're gonna talk about don't really matter. <laughs> so, so for teachers first starting out, what I recommend to do first off is contact the middle and high school choral directors and music teachers in your immediate area. So what I did was I made a spreadsheet of all of the schools that were in a 20 mile radius of where I was living at the time. And I methodically contacted each one of them 
and kept a spreadsheet along the way, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So what I would do is I would just introduce myself and I would offer a free vocal workshop for their students. So many of the choir directors would take me up on this offer. And it was really great for me in a couple ways because I really hadn't had the experience at that point of teaching in a master class setting, teaching in a group setting. So that was great experience for me. And the other thing, of course, was that when I would go to the schools, I would bring a flyer and of course my business cards with me because invariably there were students who were interested in lessons after they saw my workshop or my, my master class. I would also, of course, leave my business cards with the choir director so that they would, you know, have those on hand and could refer me to any students that were interested in lessons and that contacted them. So um, the other, so the, yeah, okay. So the other thing that came out of this endeavor for me was the possibility of teaching at these schools themselves. So, you know, when I first started teaching, I did not have a suitable teaching space. I, you know, I had a roommate and it really, for me, it wasn't conducive to a home studio environment. So at one of these high schools, I did what were called vocal pullouts during the choir sessions themselves. So I would take, uh, I would pull out one student at a time for about a 15 or 20 minute vocal mini lesson. And this was funded by the school itself, or in many cases, the choral department. Um, so that was one thing that was really, really great for, uh, for my beginning teaching endeavors. And, you know, at another high school, I taught during the students' free periods, during their lunches, after school, before school, also did some pullouts during the choir periods and the in this case it was funded by the students themselves or probably most likely their parents so that they would pay me directly so that also really worked out well i did that you know uh, i think two days a week at one school and it was a really great situation so you know and i think you know some choir directors may not have even thought of this possibility of having an outside voice teacher come in to kind of supplement their program so in in some of these cases you could be creating this position for yourself and collaborating with the choir director to make that happen okay so then i wrote squeaky squeaky wheel make contact so i want to encourage you all not to be afraid to be the squeaky wheel. You really have to follow up when you're doing this because, you know, we all know people are busy and they have busy lives. And I, I you know, I'm not telling you to be annoying and stalk anyone, of course, but what I'm telling you is that I would repeatedly call these choir directors. So, you know, I wouldn't leave a message every time. I probably would leave a message one time, but then, you know, I would call on a regular basis until finally they would pick up the phone. <laughs> so that's kind of why I kept the spreadsheet that I mentioned before, so that I could notate my previous contact attempts. Oh, I, I called this so-and-so on this date, did not make contact, or I called, made contact, they told me to call back on this date. Stuff like that was what I kept the notes about. and. You know, what I found was that when I made actual contact, AKA I spoke with someone on the phone, I could close the deal in most of these cases. So, whereas if I didn't follow up with a message or an email, I rarely would hear back from those contacts for whatever reason. So, so yeah, so don't be afraid to be the squeaky wheel. So beyond this first step, the more visibility you can get for yourself as a voice teacher, the better. So people have to be aware that teaching is something that you're trying to do. So share your new teaching endeavor with your community on social media, which we all know how powerful social media is, and see if anyone in your community has leads for you. You may be surprised at some ideas that they come up with for you and how willing people really are to help you get started. And, you know, I should also mention that you can also go the old, the old fashioned route and actually post flyers around your community. I did this as well, you know, libraries, grocery stores, pretty much any place with a bulletin board that will let you post your flyer is, is great. You know, I, I didn't, um, 
I, I didn't find that that was as powerful as some of these other methods that I'm talking about, but I think you should do as many things as you can when you're first getting started. So uh, the next thing that I did was I posted on Craigslist under services. There's a section, I think it's services and then lessons. So believe it or not, a number of my most reliable and my most longtime students actually found me initially on Craigslist. So, um, you know, it might seem weird to some people, but a lot of people use Craig Craigslist to this day. You can also try sites like takelessons.com and Thumbtack, but personally, I never had a great deal of success with some of those other sites. But again, I recommend trying as many avenues as you possibly can when you're first getting started and just see what works in your area. Um, okay, and then of course, make sure that you have a website. This is really gonna give your business legitimacy and it also will be something that you can direct people from who find you on other platforms. So say you post, post on social media or on Craigslist, you put your website address so they can click and find you there. And in terms of websites, obviously we could talk a lot more about that, but I used wix.com, W-I-X.com to create my website. And I love that site because you really don't have to be a graphic designer or artistic in any way to make a really attractive site. And it's very simple to use and it's inexpensive. So I would, I would definitely recommend Wix.com. You can go to my website and see if you like how it looks. My website is voicedbymelissa at gmail.com. Okay, so next. Hands down, the best thing for my voice Thanks. studio business has been my presence on Yelp. Going? Oh, hi. Oh, I thought I heard someone. So, in bed. What, what time is it either in the morning? Oh, I think I think someone might. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can. Who that is? Maybe it's maybe it's Alan. Yeah. Okay. Let's Okay, I'll keep going. So, so Yelp is a really powerful site, and you, some of you probably know it for finding restaurants or other things. It's an online review site, and I actually have uh, an article that was published just this month in the Journal of Singing called The Yelp Effect, Harnessing the Power of Social Media to Grow Your Voice Studio. And so I encourage you to read that article. You know, it will it will help you figure out how to get started on the site and help you decide if Yelp is the right thing for your business. So what I can say for myself is that because of Yelp, I really have a constant stream of new students and new student inquiries, and I have a robust wait list, and I've never paid a dime to Yelp for advertising. So for me, this has been, you know, kind of a godsend. <laughs> so I don't know what I would have done without Yelp in, with my studio. But uh, great. So I recommend that. The next thing I wanted to talk about is the importance of new voice teachers to think about versatility and flexibility. So I want you to think about being flexible in the who, what, when, where, how context. So what I mean by that what are you going to teach? <laughs> so what styles of singing are you willing and able to teach? So I'll just say, if you limit yourself to classical singing, your studio will probably be a little bit small. At least that's what I found. So that being said, when I did decide to teach other styles of singing besides classical, I sought out extensive additional training. So I took lessons with teachers that specialize in those styles. I did a variety of research on the differences between vocal styles. And, you know, I would say that most of the foundational elements of classical voice do transfer over to all good singing. So, you know, if you're teaching beginners, you're not gonna have too many issues so, because beginners have a lot of work to do in most cases. But, you know, if you get into teaching intermediates and more advanced students of those styles, you're gonna definitely need some extra supplemental training. So the other thing that was really great for me when I first started teaching was my ability to teach piano as well as voice. So I, I really didn't think that I could teach piano, but uh, I happened to be working at a music school at the time, and my boss convinced me to, that I could teach beginning piano to kind of fill out my schedule. And, you know, after teaching a few piano lessons, I realized that 
beginning piano is essentially just teaching basic musicianship. So I believe that most people with a bachelor of music are qualified to teach beginning piano. Now, some people, maybe piano teachers would not agree with me, but that, that's kind of what I, what I believe and what I have found. So piano was really wonderful for my voice teaching at the beginning because lots of beginning voice students are actually interested in taking a combo lesson of piano and voice. So I was able to offer that to them, which was really great. And I also found that teaching piano was, you know, a nice re respite for my voice, meaning I could teach a longer day, I could teach more hours if I had some piano lessons interspersed among the voice lessons. So, you know, it's less demonstrating, less general wear and tear on the voice. So I, I actually loved teaching piano and in some ways I kind of miss teaching piano because <laughs> I don't teach anymore. Okay, so Next, we're gonna talk about who are you going to teach? So for, for this, of course, we're talking about opening yourself, <laughs> excuse me, opening yourself up to more age groups, which is gonna increase your potential client pool. So however, again, you really need to do some research on teaching very young voices and older voices as well, if you don't have experience with those groups because they do have unique needs. So luckily, I think Nats has a lot of resources that can help you navigate these specific groups. So check out some of the other Nats chats and also the Journal of Singing for some more information. There's also lots of books you can read and check in with some of your, your mentors as well and, and to figure that out. Then when are you going to teach? This is about the hours that you are willing to teach. So. I'll just say, if you're gonna teach beginners and novices and people who have day jobs, you're gonna need to be available in the after school hours, the evenings and the weekends. That's kind of just the way it is. <laughs> and the where of where you're gonna teach, we're gonna address that in the next slide. So hang on for just a second on that one. And then the how. So I think it's important to think about how you and your business is going to evolve over, over time. So. For example, for me, I gradually phased out teaching piano, and then I gradually phased out teaching younger students because that was, for personally, not quite as satisfying for me. So as a business owner, you really need to be constantly assessing, is this still working for me? Am I enjoying this? What changes do I wanna make going forward? I think that's really important, so yes, okay. So yes, the when, or sorry, the where. <laughs> the where is your teaching space. This is an important topic and one I think that can be tricky for beginning teachers, it was for me. So as I mentioned before, I did not have a very good place to teach in my home when I first got started. So what I did was I taught a few days a week at a local music school. I, I also mentioned that I was teaching at some high schools. And so the, 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 at the music school, of course, I'm working for someone else, right? And so I got paid a fraction of what I could have made working for myself. But on the upside, I didn't have the headache of scheduling and dealing with running my own small business. I didn't have to find students, which as we mentioned before, can be one of the trickiest parts with getting started. So I definitely recommend finding you know, a local music school that hires voice teachers and seeing if you can get in with them. The other thing that I did was I worked for an agency that sent teachers into students' homes. So again, they would take a large cut of the fee, but um, in general, in-home lessons can be very lucrative if you can get into that market and you don't mind driving from house to house. So, and you know, as I worked for, other people like schools and agencies eventually my name kind of got out in the community and i was able to branch out on my own so i but i found that those were really good kind of launching pads for me okay another idea is to share your space with another teacher or teachers you know um craigslist is probably the best place to find this again i a lot of people post on craigslist looking to share a space so check that out and then don't disregard teaching from your home. So I, after I had my apartment with a roommate, then I moved to a studio apartment and I lived there for over a year. And it was, 
it was actually a guest house. So that's very common here in California and very advantageous for a home studio because I did not have any shared walls. So I wouldn't disturb neighbors or cause any other kind of disturbances with loud singing. But however, it was a one room studio apartment and it was very small. And I, I used one of these uh, Asian room dividers screens that I have pictured here uh, to separate my sleeping area from my teaching area and my living space. So, you know, I think it worked. I really do because I kept my apartment impeccably clean very clean and i really do think that my students were comfortable there and felt like it was a professional environment even though my bed was just a few feet away which is, seems a little bit strange but but it worked so don't disregard your space if and see you know when you're looking for apartments you can kind of think about that and um which is definitely what i did when i was searching for a new apartment so okay policies so it's very important to have a very clear studio policy that you can hand students at their first lesson even better i email it to my students before their first lesson and i say please read the attached studio policy and note my very strict 24-hour cancellation policy i have found that if you're upfront about your policy from the beginning before there's any issues <laughs> people are more understanding down the road. So I know it's tempting to, to feel like you have to be nice, but you know when it's your own business, I think that can be a slippery slope. So I, I think it's better to be strict and upfront in the beginning. And you know in your policy, you're gonna have to decide if you're going to accept sickness to be an excuse, excuse for canceling on short notice. This is an important issue because as singers, our instrument is our voice, right? And our body is our instrument, I should say. And I know that a lot of voice teachers do not like to teach people who are sick. I mean, of course, I don't like to either, but I did find that allowing sickness to be an excuse for canceling encourages people to lie, unfortunately, and, it, and I got many more cancellations. So what I usually say to people who tell me that they're sick and cancel less than 24 hours ahead of time, I say, you know, I'm so sorry you're not feeling well. Just so you know, most people do have to pay for one or two lessons a year that they do not use because of sickness, you know, unfor unforeseen sickness. And But I do have to keep my studio policy because my time is so limited. So thank you for understanding. So I try to be really nice about it, but also very firm. So, in, and, and also what I will say is in some cases when I say this and they know that I'm not gonna budge, the student will have a miraculous recovery. Huh, interesting. <laughs> and, and then they're able to sing just fine for their lesson and I would never even have known they're sick. So, you know, I, I, I just think that the other thing is, is you can work on musicianship or acting if the student really can't sing. But I think in most cases, I, I, I have found it's, it's better to be a little bit more strict about that. So, I have this Dostoevsky quote that I really love. If you want to be respected by others, the great thing is to respect yourself. Only by that, only by self-respect, will you compel others to respect you. So that's the important thing, I think, with, with making your policies. Think about your value as a singer. Think about your value as a teacher and honor that because people will respect those who stick up for their own worth. So that's what I would encourage in terms of policies. Okay, finances, this is important. It's a big part of our voice studio puzzle. And I, I really wanna encourage new teachers to own the fact that this is a business. So we, we need to be paid what we're worth and it's a job, it's how we pay the rent. And it doesn't matter how fun it is or how much we enjoy it. It's the same thing, of course, with being a professional singer and uh, all that goes into that. So um, what I would say is, call around and find out what the going rate is for voice lessons in your area and price yourself accordingly. If you're getting started, price yourself a little bit lower, not too much lower because then people won't think that you're, that you have something of value, but you know, that's something you can experiment with as you're getting started. And, and then decide if you want to offer a package discount. I've always found that people will buy more lessons if they're getting a discount. So that's a good way to kind of lock them in as we say. 
Uh, in terms of the nuts and bolts, of course, cash and check are standard forms of payment that most teachers accept. I also accept Venmo and PayPal. And I would say that within the last year, it's so funny, I, the majority of my students have switched to paying me through Venmo. And so, you know, if, you, if you're willing to accept Venmo, you probably will be getting a lot of payments through Venmo, which in many ways is much more convenient than check. Um, I've never accepted credit cards, but if you want to do that, that's totally possible, but just know that you will be paying a transaction fee for those, for those transactions. Okay, taxes. So the best thing that I could say about this, of course, we could have a whole snaps chat just on taxes and maybe that would be a good topic. But I would say hire a professional, hire an accountant, because throughout the year, you really should be keeping careful track of your expenses that can be written off. So your website, any advertising, supplies for your studio, sheet music, your a home studio is a write off, internet, phone, and I personally like to keep track of these expenses on a monthly basis instead of waiting till the end of the year and having to do it all at once. That's a horrible headache. And it's oftentimes really hard to remember what the expenses were in some cases. So I would do it uh, monthly. Okay. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the psychology of sales, specifically as it relates to voice teachers. So. Someone once told me that everything in life is sales. And that might seem a little bit bleak, but I really do think in a way that is true. So I actually worked as a salesperson for a while to make money while I was getting my voice studio started, you know, when I first moved to LA. And the concepts that I learned about sales in that job and the training that I received are extremely relevant to my life as a small business owner. So I wanted to share a couple of those ideas with you. Now, I never want you to be salesy because that's definitely a turnoff to potential clients. However, I want you to just be aware of a few basic principles that every salesperson knows. So the first principle is called authority. So that's just the idea that people will buy more when they view the seller as an authority figure. So for voice teachers, this means showing prospective clients why you are a voice expert and why they should trust you with their training. One very simple way that I do this is by hanging my diplomas in my studio. And you know, it's funny, I always catch people looking at them. So I think it's um, that's one small thing that can be useful in creating authority. And But most of all, I think that voice teachers need to, again, own your own worth. Remind yourself that you have spent your life studying singing. Most of us have, right? And that's a big deal. It's It makes you an authority. And your frame of mind is very important in starting your small business. I know it can be kind of tricky when you're just getting started and you're not 100% confident and all of that, you might need more experience teaching, but just try to try to own it is what I would say. Okay, the next principle is called liking. So people buy more when they like the person that they're buying from. Not a huge surprise, right? But for voice teachers, I think this means establishing rapport with prospective students as quickly as you possibly can. So be interested in their journey, figure out what makes them tick, see if you can make a personal connection right away, even if you're just talking to them on the phone to schedule an initial lesson. All of this will make them more likely to take a lesson with you. And if they're an existing student, they will be more likely to continue lessons if they genuinely like you as a person. So, <laughs> um, okay, and then the next one is called social proof. So social proof is that if someone in your network is buying something or doing something, that makes you more likely to want to buy or do that thing too. So I, I actually, it made me think, I went to a master class the other day and the master keeper teacher kept name dropping. So I realized she was trying to establish social proof by saying, this amazing singer studies with me, doesn't, can't you see how great that makes me? And you know, it was a, it was a way for her to, to establish social proof. And um, 
you know, I, I think you obviously can go overboard and annoy people with all of these ideas, but I think that there are very subtle ways that you can use social proof as a voice teacher. So for me, I, I, I think that, you know, Yelp is the biggest way that I create social proof. People see my positive reviews on Yelp and they assume that I'm a good teacher based off of those real, real, uh, reviews and this principle of social proof. Okay, and then the last one is scarcity. So if something is too available and too easy to obtain, people value it less. It's the old, we all want what we can't have phenomenon. <laughs> so it's an important one if you're just getting started out because let's say a prospective student calls you and says, hi, I'd like to set up a lesson for Friday and you're very excited because you don't have a lot of students yet, and you say, okay, great, what time? I'm wide open. <laughs> so, you know, automatically this student is gonna be thinking, oh, she's wide open, she doesn't have any other students, she, she's not very busy, maybe she's not a very good teacher if nobody else is studying with her. So, it's kind of like if you go into a restaurant and there's nobody eating in that restaurant, you might kind of question, the restaurant's quality. But so obviously when you're getting started, excuse me, when you're getting started, you will have a lot of availability. And I certainly don't want you to lie about your availability, but maybe just try to offer one or two times instead. So you could say, can you do 1 p.m. or 3 p.m. perhaps? And that's just a small thing that will create this illusion of scarcity. And of course, eventually, once your business gets off the ground and is booming, hopefully, scarcity will be automatic because you're going to be so busy. And that actually really will kind of increase the value of your product, you know, supply and demand. So, yeah, so that's my presentation, Eric. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions about anything I talked about or anything I didn't talk about. So... Let me stop showing my screen. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I learned I learned a lot too. It's really, really helpful. Oh, thank uh, you. So I have a couple questions. We can get the ball rolling. And then people who are uh, attending, please uh, raise your hand in the, uh, the uh, raise your hand on your dashboard or you can submit your questions in writing and I can ask Melissa those. But uh, so I was really intrigued. You know, you hear a lot about advertising on sites like uh, like Thumbtack or those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, but I hadn't actually heard a lot about utilizing Yelp. So mm, are there yeah. any, other, any pro tips you want to share with us uh, about yeah. Yelp how to make us kind of yeah. master utilizers of that forum? Yes, I, mean, I, I think Yelp is really powerful. I, I do think it might depend on your area. So for example, in Los Angeles, it's very utilized. People people use Yelp a ton. So, you know, you just kind of have to check out uh, whether or not it's something that can be useful in your area. But I would say, you know, and I, I talk about all this in my article that I wrote. So if you, you know, want more details, but the first thing that you can do, so say you you don't have a presence on Yelp yet. The first thing to do is you can actually create your own business listing on Yelp. So you go on and you create, you, you, you start the listing. So mm -hmm. the way Yelp works is that either the business owner can create the listing or the client can create the listing. So oftentimes if it's a restaurant and it has doesn't have a Yelp, um, a, a Yelp presence yet, the client might be the first person to create the listing. But with me, I went on and I created my uh, my Yelp account and I put in all of the information about my business. You can put a little blurb in about yourself. You put in your general area. Because I was teaching from my home, I didn't put my exact address, which is really nice. They let you put like a general location. I put like kind of the street that I was on. and. And then, you know, the, the cool thing about Yelp is that because it's such a big website, it has such a huge internet presence that bec if you're on it, even if you don't have a lot of reviews, it's going to increase your visibility on Google. So right. because of the way, you know, the internet works and all of sure. that magicalness. <laughs> so, yeah. 
So, so yeah, I would say that, you know, even if you have zero reviews, right. you put yourself up there and then, you know, so technically a business owner is not supposed, according to Yelp's guidelines, you should not ask students for a review directly because that's against their policy. So kind of to get around that, you can, you know, make a little flyer or something and place it in your studio and say, uh, you know, I'm on Yelp and just right. let them know, right? You know, so that they can, you know, and you know, just between me and you, if it's right. one of your longtime students, you can, you know, and someone you know really well and, you, you can drop a subtle hint and ask them to write you a review, even though it's technically not allowed. But obviously we know that that happens all the time. So, sure. um, but, oh, you know what? I would say my biggest tip about um, Yelp is if, if so say you want someone to write you a review or you want your presence known on Yelp, the worst thing that you can do is to take the link from Yelp and share it on social media or send it to someone in an email. Do you know why? Why? Because if someone clicks that link, Yelp automatically thinks that you are requesting a review from someone and their algorithm will actually then filter out that review. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So, so that's, I mean, that's what most people would do, right? Oh, can you write me a review and give the person the link? So what's better, what, <laughs> if you want to do that, is to say, I'm on Yelp, my, my, Business name is, for me. I say my business name is Voice by Melissa, and um, so if you have time, I would love some feedback from you. Great, wonderful, fantastic. <laughs> uh, the, you know, you brought up something uh, when you're talking about Yelp. Yeah. That we're we're soliciting a lot of our clients from online, so you're meeting with people that you may not have met in person, which is. Uh, it could potentially be problematic, right? So what, what are some ways that you you can advise us to make sure we're always staying safe when we're when we're meeting with potential clients that we just met on the internet? Yes, this is a this is a really important topic and I think you know internet safety is is hugely important. So what I would say is you can I if I meet someone online or someone finds me online, I will try to have a phone conversation with them ahead of the lesson because I have really found that you can tell what someone's intentions are when you talk to them on the phone, right? So, and I, I personally, knock on wood, <laughs> I have never had a single incident where I felt unsafe or I felt like someone was taking advantage, you know, doing right. anything out of, you know, what's perfectly um, appropriate. Sure. So, um, but I do think, you know, kind of talking to them first and just making sure that they are who they say they are. You can also, the other thing that I'll sometimes do is I'll Google people, right? We all do that nowadays. So if someone oh, yeah. finds me online, I Google them and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, this is someone in my community and someone who's like, you know, a real person and all sure. of that. Sure. But, you know, you can't avoid getting spam um, by not putting your um, your direct address, especially if you work from home, I think that's an imp important thing is to you know leave that off because you don't certainly don't want people just out of the blue showing up at your right. home and stuff right. like that. You have I was, I was just thinking as you were talking too, maybe another way to do that is you could do a con initial consult in a public place, especially if maybe you maybe. Not that you got a bad feeling, but if you just aren't one hundred percent sure, you just want to be one hundred percent extra safe. Yeah, have, yeah. You know, eat at a Starbucks or something and have an initial consult. Talk about their goals. Talk about your approaches. Get a feel for the person. That's a uh, really good idea. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think you know also um, you know when I was teaching out of my one room studio and uh, you know I would be letting people into my <laughs> my apartment. I, right. I always had in the back of my mind if if I got even an inkling of a weird feeling. Uh, I would not let them through the the gate. You know what sure. I mean? I would I would say, you know what? I actually I'm I'm uh, not able to keep this appointment right now. Sorry. So right. you know, that's that's the other thing is is follow your gut and you know use your don't don't um don't be afraid to just follow your follow your initial uh, gut reaction. Absolutely. You know, uh, not, it, protecting yourself goes beyond that. I think too. I think. Especially when you're working with minors, you want to protect yourself from any any potential 
misunderstanding or or worry about um, some of the the lines that might be crossed. Do you allow parents to observe your lessons if you're working with minors? Do you allow observers? How how do you kind of handle that situation? Yeah, that is a that is an important thing now, especially with our uh, culture and everything and the climate of the country. Uh, you know, I. I definitely allow parents to sit in on and, and any visitor to sit in on a lesson that I'm teaching. And so and, and I tell people that in the studio policy, feel free to bring a friend, feel free to bring your parent, feel free to bring anyone you want, you know, to to the lesson, because um, obviously I want people to feel comfortable. And, you know, the issue of whether as a voice teacher, you're going to touch your student, you know, to, to show them about breathing. And that's, I think, a, a something you have to kind of make a judgment call about um, for yourself and also kind of reading the students and, you know, kind of, and also, of course, always asking permission um, before you do that. You know, I always encourage my students, especially, you know, my college students, uh, yeah. encourage them, okay, will you please make sure you record this lesson, you know, for many reasons, you know, what you yeah. hear is different than what I hear, or um, I might say something and you miss it. But especially when I'm working with minors or first-time students as I get to know them, I will frequently record the lesson also. Wow, I never thought way. of it. That way, you know, if someone said, you know, on this date, you know, you, you, you said something or did something that made me uncomfortable, you can say, well, here's the recording of the whole lesson, point out where that was. That's another way to protect yourself, so. That's a great, great idea. I never thought to do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal that trick, thank you. <laughs> no teamwork. Look at this. Uh, okay, we're getting some great questions coming in from uh, some of our listeners, so let's check those out. Um, okay, the first the first question we had is, uh, thank you so much for all of this information. Uh, I love your approach to starting the studio. Do you uh, do you do recitals for your students? And if so, how do you make them successful? Uh, this person says, I tried with a few students that I have, but most of them were too shy to sing in front of anyone that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. Is this something I'm doing or could improve on, or is it just my beginning student clientele? Uh, do, do you advocate, do you recommend student recitals? So can you talk a little bit about if, if that's part of your approach as a teacher? Yeah, and I think, you know, it depends on your clientele. So I would say in some years that I've been teaching, I it would be appropriate for me to hold a recital, and then in other other times, it wouldn't be. You know, if I if you have a lot of adult students who are, just doing it for fun and you know trying to you know become better at karaoke <laughs> they might not want to do that you know but if you have a studio full of teenagers then for sure a recital is a great idea what i also do and uh, i actually since starting my dma and starting school i haven't had as much time to do this but i used to monthly have a studio class so mm -hmm. i would encourage my students to come. I think I would just charge them like $10 to come and sing for each other. It was a very kind of informal thing. So if you're having trouble getting people to get on board with the, the idea of a recital, maybe start with an informal kind of studio class. You can have like, you know, snacks and drinks and kind of make it fun and a low pressure kind of way to kind of get your feet wet before you um, do a do a full kind of recital. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Do you so? Do you play, or are, are, do you or do you feel comfortable enough uh, at the keyboard to play for yourself? I feel comfortable enough to pay, play a lot of repertoire, <laughs> right. and I yeah. and I will strategically pick repertoire that I can play. But I also use, you know, I'll, I'll use I'll use accompaniment tracks. So if sure. it's something that's really difficult, a musical theater piece, or you know, a classical piece that's beyond what I feel like I can do justice to as a pianist, and I need to prepare a student for an audition or something that's important, we will we will use a track either made by a, a great pianist that's gonna be playing for them, or you know you can find amazing accompaniment tracks now on YouTube too. So yeah. I, I, I'm not shy to do to do that either. But you know, I, I would say um, for a recital, I think it's a nice touch if you can hire an outside pianist, unless you're a really great pianist, right? Because it's it's a lot of pressure. For the studio classes, I'm fine to play, but for a recital, I think it's nice to have, you know, a, a, a pianist if you can afford that. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, uh, my students will tell you that I'm far from the best pianist in the world. <laughs> yes, yeah. I feel like I can almost hear the ones who are attending laughing <laughs> through the screen. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I think that there are apps out there, too, you know, where you have a little control over the tempo and can the key. Uh, I'm not going to name them by name because we're not sponsoring anyone, although, you know, get at me, guys. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but, you know, uh, but there are apps out there that work really well, too. And I think that those, I think that's smart with the track or bringing in an accompanist or have, using an app because uh, sometimes even, even on a piece that I'm comfortable enough to even fake, that's taking a lot of my energy and focus and I'm not listening as well. So I think that's, I think that's great. I agree completely. So, uh, okay, great. Let's, uh, hopefully that answers uh, that question. Uh, let's check out another question. We've got, uh, hello, a couple of parents in my area reached out for voice lessons children between the ages of seven and ten mm -hmm. i have two questions how would you communicate with parents who uh challenge your credentials and ability to teach so maybe uh some overly cautious parents that want to make sure they're getting the best teacher mm -hmm. and then two i usually give sample lessons before starting for teaching potential students who are a bit shy would you offer any suggestions about how to make them more comfortable thank you so much and i'd add to that a third part maybe i get a lot of questions do you offer uh, a free first lesson consultation. I, I, I have colleagues who offer free first lessons. I also have colleague, colleagues who charge actually more for their first lesson consultation than they do the regular. So we'd love right. to get your input on some of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I have actually, I don't, I don't think I ever did a free initial lesson, um, but I think it's a great idea. If you don't have any students and you're trying to kind of make a name for yourself, go ahead. And if you have the time to do it. Um, but I, I could, I would say also, you know, value your time and uh, value what you have to offer. So, um, but I've never charged more for the initial consultation. I just charge my, my regular rate, but people do often inquire, Oh, do you do a free consultation? I think if I did do that, uh, I would be spending a lot of time um, giving away my services for free. So I, I I haven't started doing that. What I will say is that you can offer a 30 minute lesson. If you more oh, yeah. hours say, oh, take a 30 minute lesson. It's a little less expensive and you can just kind of get a feel for if we're gonna work well together. Sure. So so that's that. And then what was the other piece? So um, we have, uh, how do you respond to maybe parents who are challenging your credentials, your ability to teach, you know, um, they, they use the word challenging. I'm not sure if they mean, um, if they mean, um, so Crystal, feel free to send some clarification if you want, but um, do, I don't yeah, know if they mean. Yeah, deal, sometimes dealing with parents can be such a pain, and that's one reason why <laughs> I uh, kind of have phased out teaching younger students, because parents, especially in this day and age, they can be really, really, um, needy and uh, over overly involved so i would just own again own your worth and you know you can you can tell them where you got a diploma in singing you know where where you went to school or if you're currently in school you can you can tell them about the people you studied with you can tell them any additional training that you've received or any anything like that but i think if you just it's it's also in the way we present ourselves in the way that we talk and the confidence that we project that makes people kind of realize oh wow this person knows what they're talking about and and when you do teach it for initial lesson and the parent is in the room sometimes that can be a little intimidating i think when you're first getting started but don't doubt yourself right and have a plan so with with beginning students or even teaching a beginning lesson in general kind of think out what your ideal lesson is going to look like have a couple exercises in mind so that you're not like uh what do i do next right you got to have you got to look like you've done this a lot even if you even if you haven't and yeah. as you get more experience of course you will become more and more polished which is just part of you know doing it over and over again so yeah, yeah but i th i think it's it's mostly about just projecting that confidence and 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 um not being afraid to you know, have them have them come observe and see that you're getting results with their child. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, that makes sense. I think too, it's important to kind of have some exercises in mind that you can use specifically to kind of diagnose the voice that you're getting. You yeah. You're teaching when I'm teaching, at least I I do a lot of responding to what I'm hearing. I I, I don't always go in with a specific game plan because you know right. 
what they did last week, there may have been a lot of changes to what they're doing. And if I go with a game plan, then I have to scrap it if something new pops up. And oh. with a brand new student, sometimes it can be, oh gosh, where do I start? You know, there's yeah. some good stuff going on, but there's five things I could talk about. Right. But having that firm game plan of this is how I'm going to diagnose the student. That way the student knows you have a plan. Anyone yeah. observing it's understanding. So yeah, I think that's really great advice. Yeah, uh, and I agree with you. You know, the art of teaching is being able, learning how to respond in the moment and having yeah. done it over and over so that when these things come up, you're, you, you, you know how to handle them. But that, that takes experience. And that's why the more you can kind of teach and put in those hours in the studio, the, the better teacher you become, I think, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think that's sometimes the biggest challenge, you know, when I'm working with my vocal pedagogy class. So I'm right. working with new teachers. A lot of yeah. times they're, they're frozen not because they don't know what to do, they don't know how to do something. They don't yeah. know what to talk about first or how to address it. It's they hear four or five things and they get a little paralyzed by which one to right. choose. But yeah. try to trust your instinct, and you know, and and just trust your ears and trust your instinct and and pursue whatever you hear. So yeah, yeah and don't be afraid to change course too, right? If something's not working, then you try something else, and you you just kind of it's a it's a it's a cool game of being a detective. I think being a voice teacher, right? You know, because sometimes you don't know exactly right. what's what's going to work. <laughs> yeah, I always warn my students, you know, we yeah. a lot this this is not like is, this voice lessons are not like piano lessons, you know. I'm right. not going to watch what you do and then correct it. It's a lot of trial and error and we discover yeah. things together. So, I think sometimes having that conversation with the parent too and explaining how voice lessons are different than other instruments and that yeah. a lot of it getting to know the voice that will help them feel comfortable too so that's so true because it is different than an instrument so that that's important yeah um so one uh one of our one of our uh attendees asks what kind of insurance suggestions do you have mm -hmm. well i have never had uh insurance <laughs> <laughs> I uh, in, in Los Angeles, you are required to register for a business license if you, you know, if you have your own business and you're making money. Um, so, you know, I, I have a business license, but I've never had insurance. Actually, when I worked at Beverly Hills High School, that's not true. I did have insurance when I worked at Beverly Hills High School and they required me to purchase insurance. Right. So, um, and it was a liability plan. I can't remember the details of it, but it, it covered me up to a certain amount of um, damages. But I, um, you know, unless you have a lot of money to, I guess, lose, right. you know, it's probably not necessary for, for most people to have liability insurance. What, what, do you have any, Eric? Well, you know, through the university, I think oh, it's a little I, different. I don't, I don't teach a whole lot privately. Um, right. But I think that I do know a lot of uh, people, and and I have other. That sounds so. <laughs> I, so I have some other business interests too, and you know we we've had those discussions too with uh with insurance, and I think the best course of action is just just speak to whoever mm -hmm. you have your car or uh, you know auto or home yes. insurance, and kind of explain this is this is the, what I'm doing. I'm taking in about this much money a month. Right. After, Prize and what do you recommend and, and talk to your insurance agent and they're right. going to have some questions for you or they're going to say maybe you know maybe you don't need to worry about it or here's a plan right. I would suggest but I do think um, always better safe than sorry so if you feel yes. uh, to the person who asked this question Christine if you if you have, if you're worried about that or if you're um, feeling a little stressed then I, I definitely better safe than sorry and it's not going to hurt to have it so talk talk to your current uh, agent and discuss what what you're doing and, and get some uh, input from them is my suggestion we got a little uh we got a little clarification from uh crystal who's asking the question about the parents so i just want to check that out really quickly mm -hmm. uh, i had a mother who brought in their daughter her daughter for a sample lesson at the end of the lesson she bluntly asked why should i pick you as my daughter's voice teacher hmm. <laughs> during the sample lesson she also attempted to talk over me while i was talking oh She's god like, thank you for answering my question so yeah i don't think uh Crystal, my personal note before Melissa answers, I feel you. <laughs> I think we've all, uh, the more we teach voice, the more we're likely to encounter some stage parents. And <laughs> yeah. we're just really, really, really invested in the success of their kids. So yeah. have you had to deal with some parents like that? And if so, what what, what are some of your techniques? Yes, I, I have. And I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, too, you have to just, in terms of uh, the sales aspect that I talked about, you know, 
if they don't see the value in studying with you and you don't you don't need to prove yourself you don't need to convince them to study with you 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 the other thing that i think is important is whether or not someone chooses to study with you that's not going to make or break your career or your life and in some cases with these stage parents maybe you would prefer not to have uh, to deal with them. I mean, we've also also had all had students where they're texting you constantly. They're way too, you know, they're way too involved. And um, th those kind of students take up a lot of time and, you know, maybe are not worth having in your studio. And sometimes you, you have to kind of let students go. And so I would just I would just say sometimes, um, you know, it's more, they're more, they're more trouble than they're worth. Some of those kind of parents and those students as well. So don't, don't feel like you need to, but um, again, just you, instead of trying to convince her of why should I pick, why should you pick me? Uh, just say, you know, I, I really, I'm really confident in my ability to teach voice. And I, here are the things that I hear in your daughter's voice. And here are the things that I know that I could help her with. Sure. And just give that, you know, very clear diagnosis and, and then let them decide. And, and, I, think that's, and that. I think that's such great advice is let them decide. You know, when you, I, I, I give the same advice to my, my students who are becoming voice teachers. The, mm -hmm. same, I give the same advice as I give my students who are auditioning for gigs, you know. Right. Yes. Uh, you know, you want, you want the student to enjoy working with you and you want to enjoy working with them. It's just like when you go on an audition, you want to be what they're looking for. If you try to be something else, then you're both just going to be frustrated, right? If you're not the teacher that's the best fit or that student's not a good fit for you, trying to force it is just going to frustrate everyone. So oh, it's sure. hard to let a student go, you know, especially as you're just starting. But I think in the long run, your mental health, your happiness is going to be better if you let a student that's not a good fit go rather right. than trying to convince them or try to to change the way you teach to, to suit them so you don't lose a student. So I think that's really great advice. My grandmother used to say, she, this was about something else, but relationships, but she would say, never run after a man or a bus. There's always another one coming. <laughs> that's so good advice. I would say the same thing for students. Never run after a student or a bus. There's always another one coming around the corner. Exactly, exactly. Especially if you're investing the time and resources into some of these uh, promotional materials and, and yeah. experiences that you're talking about. Yeah, you'll you'll get incoming students. So, yeah, I guess Crystal, our advice is tell them what you would what your plan is for that for their child, and let them decide if that's a plan that suits their needs and and go from there. And if and if it's not, then don't be afraid to say, well, you know, I can recommend some colleagues who might be better fit for you, because yeah. I think in the long run everyone's going to be happier. Right. Um. So we were talking a little bit about uh um using a companist maybe for a studio class or for recitals. We have someone asking, regarding hiring the accompanist, is this something that you think the teacher should be paying for or should the student, you should be asking the students to pay for those pianists? What, do you, what are your viewpoints on that if you've used pianists in the past? Yeah, well, I, I think that the, the students should, should pay for it. So, but if you're hiring an accompanist for an hour, and the students all chip in a little bit, or you know, and that you can also have a rehearsal if it's for a recital. But uh, if if the students all pay a little bit, just divide it by the number of students you're going to have, and then that's the accompanist fee right there. But I, you know, but I also know voice teachers who will just pay that fee, and that's just kind of a a bonus of studying in their studio that that's that's provided. So you just kind of have to um decide for yourself i personally would recommend having them chip in a little bit i don't i don't like to offer too many things for free because i feel like people don't value it then even if you're just going to charge ten dollars it's 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 something it's making them put their part into what's happening yeah people can be more invested if they're paying for it i think exactly. uh, yeah i think maybe an answer too would be if you're if you know you're going to do recitals every six months, you know, we do two recitals a year in my private studio. You might even just build in to the cost over those six months hmm. a couple of dollars a month. That way you can pay the accompanist and it doesn't feel like you're asking for more. That might be another way, too, if you kind of build that into the pricing structure. And in yeah. the agreement, it says here's the price per lesson. That will also include a pianist for a recital two times a year or whatever. So you could maybe do it that way, too. Just brainstorm. Yeah. Great. Uh, so we're talking about 
pianos, talking about pianists, I think a lot of times people are a little stressed yeah. about to because maybe they don't have room or their 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 apartments on the fourth floor. They're like there's no way I can have a grand piano in my house. Do you think we need a grand piano? Do we need an actual piano? Is a digital piano adequate? What are your thoughts on that? I, uh, you can kind of see my digital piano in the background. I, I have a digital piano and I've always had a digital piano except when I taught some lessons at, out of my, my parents' home when I was, you know, in grad school. But I, but since, you know, being on my own, I, I invested in a nice digital, it's a, a, a nice digital piano and I, I actually think that it's better than having an acoustic, especially if you're going to be teaching people who want to do pop music and beginning singers who are gonna need some key changes because I can just press my digital piano button and take it up a half step, take it down two whole steps, whatever I need to do, and it makes it really simple, you know, also, you know, being a, a humble pianist, the you know, humble pianist that I am, I, I recommend a digital piano. Then you also don't have to pay for uh, piano tuning and all of that stuff. You don't have to worry about the weather and whatnot and the space that it would require. And actually, the first digital piano that I purchased was a really, really slim one, but it it still had like a frame. Uh, it was just like the bottom of the line of the Kawaii pianos, and uh, it was very affordable. And it, but it looked it looked nice and it, it did the job. So I, I would say uh, I, I recommend a digital piano. Believe it or not. No, oh, wonderful, great. So we're we're right at about an hour. Um, so I think this has been really informative. I think we've had some really great ideas shared. Any last any last words? Sounds a little scary, but any final thoughts you have for the people who are attending? Kind of to wrap things up, or I I would just say it's it's all a process, right? And it's a journey, and it's the only the only constant is change. So you're gonna be kind of working with your small business and making tweaks here and there. I'll make tweaks to my studio policy because something, you know, one time I had a student who came in wearing like, a, she was like drenched in perfume. And I said, oh, I need to add that to my studio policy. Please don't wear perfume. You know, just little things like that, that come up and just be flexible and be ready to kind of roll with the punches and, and know that it's a business. And with any business, there's going to be ups and downs. Uh, but overall, I think it's a really such a, you know, such a rewarding endeavor to be a voice teacher and to get to help people like that. So, yeah. So I would just say good luck and you can do it. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Melissa, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for those of you who attended. Uh, we had a great time. And uh, if you're watching this live or if you're watching this archived later, please keep up on our uh, future Snats chats. We've got uh, a lot of uh, ideas coming up for the future, so keep an eye out for those topics. And again, Melissa, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. It's a lot of fun. Right. I appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay.